Good morning. Um, I had the good fortune of working on the British Airways change program in the early 1980s. Uh, I tell you this because uh, as a young man I met a very senior director, the director of IT, a man called John Watson. And he said to me, do you know John, all my life I've been doing big IT projects and what I've learned is that uh, every time you do a big IT project it costs seven times as much as you originally thought. And I thought, well, you must be doing something wrong then. <laughs> but I didn't say so, because, you know, if you don't kind of question senior people. But it stuck with me, um, and I think that is the case. In fact, I think it's worse than that. Uh, many major IT programs never see the light of day. You know, just to give you some examples from the UK. Uh, the Rural Payments Agency, this is an agency that has to pay subsidies to farmers. You know, the, the European Union changed the rules, so we had to pay the subsidies in a different way. Uh, they decided to do it through a new computer system, an, an IT-led change. Uh, it cost them 32 million, and it failed. And the most incredible thing is, having failed, they then rehired the same IT company to do more work. That's a, that's a kind of a cute way of, you know, is this the way to do business? Let's, you know, let's fail, get more money. Huh. <coughs> the uh, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, that's our tax office, has spent nine billion pounds on an IT-led change. Um, they've managed to mess up the majority of pay-as-you-earn taxation. You know, there's, there's something like two million people uh, have paid uh, too little tax, there's 4 million people paid too much tax, and there's another 17 million people they're not sure about. <laughs> and they did it in two years. Brilliant. That's most of the people on PAYA. And of course, we've, you know, our health service has spent tens of billions on a computer system that will never see the light of day. No, you know, what's going wrong here? How do we normally do IT, big scale IT? Well, you know, the managers write a spec, and then the IT company writes a spec, and then they have a kind of discussion about it. And this is where the IT company get into what I call features as benefits. You can have this, you can have that, and the managers go, woo. And so the spec builds. Then we buy the hardware, write the software, train the people, put it in, and it don't work. That's kind of what happens, isn't it? Some people would say, yeah, yeah, we know it doesn't happen. So, so this is clearly a contractual problem. So if we, improve, if we improve the way we write our contracts and we improve the way we do our project management, that'll do it. Well, I think that's just doing the wrong thing righter. Uh, some people think, well, it's a question of, well, why don't we take these IT tools and get straight down there on the line, and so we'll go fast, agile. But that could be doing the wrong thing faster. I think the problem is much deeper. I think we've got a problem of management thinking. The way we think about the design and management of work. And of course, uh, IT people share some of the assumptions that managers have uh, about the way to design and manage work. I mean, in a sense, if you didn't share those assumptions, you wouldn't get the work, would you? Uh, it was Deming who, in the 1980s, alerted me to the fact, the obvious fact, that we, mankind, invented management, um, and it doesn't work very well. We think of management as top-down functional hierarchy. Uh, we think we should separate decision-making from work. The managers make decisions, and the workers should do the work. Uh, we think that managers should make decisions with budget data, activity data, cost data, standards, service levels. That's the lingua franca of decision-making. We teach managers to manage people and manage budgets. And if it's not news to you, it doesn't work very well. And if, if management doesn't work very well, then the IT that we use won't work very well either. And I don't know about you, but if I were you, that would piss me off. <laughs> so I want to illustrate this problem with a case. I'm going to talk about what this case, what these people might have done if they'd followed the normal route to implementing IT, and I'm going to tell you what they actually did do, because they met me. They were lucky. <laughs> first, first of all, let me tell you about their result. This is a housing repairs business 
We have a, a supplier, a private sector supplier, uh, supplying housing repairs as a service to a local council, uh, actually in Portsmouth on the south coast of England. Um, and uh, today, they deliver a repair on the day and at the time the tenant wants it. How cool is that? <laughs> How cool is that? I mean, do you know, you know I, I don't know what, what telecoms companies are like in your country, but it, at home we have one called BT, yeah, and if they could do that, we'd all cheer. Now, not only do they deliver a repair on the day and at the time the tenant wants it, they do this at half, at half the original cost. Wow. Now, let me tell you, let me tell you basically what housing repairs looks like. Um, I, I want you to imagine now, I'm the manager and you're the IT supplier and I'm just kind of described for you my business and what my IT needs are, okay? I've got tenants out there uh, and when they've got something wrong with their house, they call up and they call my call centre, okay? Uh, and basically there's two jobs to do in the call centre. The first job is to work out, well, what kind of uh, target should we give this repair? You see, because we have... Uh, government-inspired targets, certain repairs have to be done as emergencies in 24 hours, some have to be done urgently within seven days, and all others have to be done within 28 days. So the first task is what kind of target applies to this repair. The second task you have to do in the call centre is uh, work out what the repair is, and, and they have a little book they call the Schedule of Rates. This is kind of a book with everything can go wrong with a house, and the jobs, uh, and the materials that you need for the jobs, and the time it would take a repairman to fix it, standard times. Okay, so they've got to work out which job this is and give it a code. That's basically what they do in the call centre. Then, having worked that out, they, they pass this to a supervisor who supervises the tradesman, and the a supervisor gives the tradesman the job, and, and off they go to fix it. They get the materials, go to the house and fix it. That's basically it. It's a really simple little organisation. You might think, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> and and what, what I want from the IT people is the ability to have a little electronic workflow system between my call centre and my supervisors. That's what I want. Okay? That's all I want. But then, of course, we have the step where you know, we get into features as benefits, you see, because then the IT people turn around and say, well, yeah, you can have that, no problem. We, if you notice that, they will say, yeah, we can, it's doable, it's all doable. But you could also have, see, what we could do is we could uh, kind of identify and program in what target applies to what different types of work, because there's a list of, you know, if it's this kind of work, it should be this type. We could do that, we could put all that in your computer. And the manager's thinking, oh, yeah, I like, I like that. Because this is the guy who's got a thing on the wall that says, our people are our most important asset. And he's, <laughs> but he's also, I'll oh, get these buggers doing it right. You know? And they say, oh, well, we can also we can put the schedule of rates in there. Have the whole, we put the schedule of rates in your computer system too. So then we could just create a front end, you know, where a dialogue where they go, is it one of these, is it one of these? You know, so we can kind of dumb down your front end and make sure then, you know, the, and you go, oh, yeah, have some of that. <laughs> and they say, and, all, and you know, you've got these guys going out and doing these repairs. You, Mr. Manager, must be interested in who achieves the repairs in the standard times. So what we could also do is we could measure, we can measure that for you, you know, that when the guy gets a repair, when he gets in, uh, and how many of these guys are doing it on the standard times. And the manager's going, oh, oh, I love it, I love it. I'll control these buggers. Well, well, they didn't do any of that. Um, all that stuff's junk, actually. All that stuff's junk. It's how to make organisations not work. But the managers don't know it. You see, take, for example, the schedule of rates. The managers believe that the schedule of rates is controlling costs. It's like in the health service as well, protocols, you know. Let's specify what the operation is. Let's specify what the repair is. That will control our costs. Well, it actually doesn't. But if you said to a manager running housing repairs, you know, the schedule of rates, which you so admire and love, is actually driving your costs up, they'd walk away from you. It just doesn't fit 
what's in their head. And hence I developed a method, I call it the Vanguard Method, because my company is called Vanguard, which is a way of helping people unlearn and learn. And when the Vanguard Method is applied to situations where they want to implement IT, there's basically three steps. Step one is understand the what and why of performance as a system. Go study. Step two, improve the design without touching the IT. You can turn it off or you can treat it as a constraint. Step three, now we've improved the design, pull IT into the new design. You spend less and you get more. So let me explain how this works for housing repairs. Now, <laughs> housing repairs is a transactional system, okay, and for transactional systems there are basically six steps that you follow when you study them as systems. The first step is you say, well, what is the purpose of this system from the customer's point of view? Now, it's kind of pretty obvious, isn't it? That most customers want a repair done as quickly as possible. Yeah, you might think that a lot of customers want a repair done on the, when it suits them, but of course this is social housing, you know, so they'd be pretty happy if you just got it done as quickly as possible. Kind of thing. Now you're going to come back to that at step three. Step two is to study demand. Study demand into the system. You're interested in two types of demand. Value demand, that's what we're here for. So what do we understand about the problems that we're having with our properties? Okay, very important. The other type of demand we want to study is failure demand. A failure demand I define as demand caused by a failure to do something or do something right for the customer. You understand? And that's when managers got their first shock. And this is important, you see, the managers have to do this work. It's no good me doing this work, because they'll just walk away. You say, if you walk in and say, as indeed they found, 50% of your demand or more is actually failure demand, you know, they probably set a target to reduce it, you know? <laughs> Poor bunnies. <laughs> failure demand tells you that your service isn't working. So what is failure demand? Well, it's things like, you know, he ain't arrived, it ain't right, it's still broke, that kind of thing. He didn't come, he left me a ticket through the door, that kind of thing. So that's their, they get a first shock, because you kind of realise as a manager that if more than half of the demand here in my call centre is failure demand, look how much resource it's consuming. It actually takes longer to deal with than value demand. You know, with value demand you decide what it is and ship it on. With failure demand you've got to find someone, work out what's going on, do a bit of progress chasing. It consumes resource. And they'd be inclined to want to do something about it, and you have to say, no, no, don't do anything. You haven't finished studying this system yet. The step, third step is to measure. To measure the capability of the system from the customer's point of view. And the interesting, so you're actually asking them, you know, well, from a customer's point of view, for how long does it take from when they put their hand up till they get a repair done? Now, the managers think their targets are a proxy for that, and they're doing 100% on all their targets. 100% emergencies, and 100% urgents, and 100% other. But you have to make them study. No, no, let's get into the system. You actually physically do it, you do it manually, you get into the IT system. When did somebody put their hand up? When did we actually fix it? And that's when they get a major shock. Because what they learn is it's typically taking an average of 50 days to effect a repair. It can take as long as 150 days to effect a repair. This makes their sphincters move. They are shocked. But you don't know why. Then the fourth step is you must go and study the flow. <laughs> this isn't read the procedures manuals. This isn't ask the people what they do. This is follow pieces of work. Follow repairs. And then the puzzle starts to unravel. You see, the reason it's taken as long as 152 days is first of all you discover that quite a lot of the time the supervisors or the tradesmen are cancelling repairs because the tenant wasn't in. I'm not going to be punished on my targets because the tenant wasn't in, so I cancel repair. And when the tenant calls up, failure demand will start another repair. This is normal behaviour. This is using people's ingenuity to survive in a system. 
Another thing you learn is that one repair from a tenant's point of view could be four repairs in this system. If they have a broken window, we turn up and board it up, tick, emergency, but then we might have to do the plastering and the painting and whatever else. So there's a whole series of other jobs, all on 28-day targets, so it can run on for ages. But you also find a deeper problem. You see, you start to discover that basically from a design point of view, you've got somebody who doesn't understand the plumbing, talking to somebody in a call centre who also doesn't understand the plumbing, who gives a specification to someone who does. Are you ever going to get that right? <laughs> and, and then when you ask, another measure of capability is, OK, you know, let's get the managers going out with the tradesmen. The only thing we can focus on here is when we walk into a property, do we fix it? At the time we walk in, first time. And the answer is less than 40% of the time. Well, it's no surprise. Now, when you know all of this, you can redesign. And so move to step two. When you redesign, it's very important to understand the value demands. That's why we're here. So in housing repairs, you have to study demand from the properties and you study demand by geography. Because you know, one of the things you learn is that different estates were built at different times, have different problems, and these problems are predictable. And what these managers discovered having studied demand, value demand over time, is that the property repair problems are predictable. Having understood that, what they then did is they resourced for their tradesmen to be available to what we call the upper limit. Now this actually means there'll be times when your tradesmen are sitting on the backside. <gasps> Can't have that. Can't have that. You know, my job is to sweat the assets, you know. No, 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 no. It's, like, it's the same as Taichiano in the manufacturing uh, Toyota system. He said, you know, don't buy a machine and run it all day. That's a stupid thing to do. It creates inventory. You think you've got lower unit costs. Actually, your costs have gone up. What matters is that the machine is ready when the flow comes along. And it's the same with the tradesmen. We need to have sufficient tradesmen with the right expertise so when demand hits, we can fix the problems. And then they decided the right way to do this, because the demand is predictable and they've resourced for it, the right way to do this is to actually, when the tenant rings up, to say, OK, you've got a repair, what day and what time would you like it done? And when they started doing this, quite a lot of the tenants on the other end of the line just went silent. You know? <laughs> so, no, no, I'm ringing the council, you've got to be kidding. No, 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 really, we need the day and the time. Well, I'll give you the day, but I don't mind what time. No, 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 the way we work is, OK, we'll give you a time. This is when we're coming, because that's the way we work. They do another remarkable thing. When the tradesman gets into the house, he rings back to the centre and says, this is how long I'm going to be. Oh, shit, you can't do that. You can't do that, can you? These guys will just goof off all afternoon, won't they? Well, they don't, you see, because they're all working in a visible system. And why is this important? Because what they learned when they studied the system is that no two jobs are the same. Standard times is for dummies. You see, if you use standard times as they do in BT, I mean, this happened to me. You know, there I am. I actually, I called BT, I wanted a little job done. I was amazed that I got through, got to a born body. I was amazed they said the man's coming Friday, and then I was double amazed that he turned up on Friday. <laughs> but he walked into my house, and he, I made him a cup of coffee. Uh, he looked at his palm top. I explained what I wanted done. He looked at his palm top, and he went, Shh, no, it's not what it says on here, so. <laughs> well, you just told me it's not what it says on here. I'm going to go. Now, I made him a cup of coffee, so he couldn't go. <laughs> he had to drink his coffee. But I kind of discovered that basically, if he didn't leave my house by 10 past 10 in the morning, his tracker system in his van would send a signal to his manager, who beat him up. <laughs> and then it took about four months before we got a simple job done. And when it was done, it took 20 minutes. You know, that's how you build your cost.
What these guys have understood is in service organisations there's variety in demand. You have to design to absorb that variety. The best way to absorb that variety is to have the tradesman say how long he's going to be there. Now, they did this manually. They developed a T-card system on a wall with days and tenants and jobs in time order. This is when that tenant wants that job. And then from the, the guys saying how long they're going to be, another T-card system saying this is when the guy's going to come free today. So you can see it and watch it visually. Oh look, that job's coming to the time. This guy's going to be free. He'll get that job. And they also did another remarkable thing. When the tradesman's on site and he doesn't have the materials that he needs in his van, usually because they're too big to carry in a van, they ask him when he wants them delivered. You see, because they've understood that if you're changing out a bath, you want the new bath to arrive when the old bath is coming down the stairs. That's perfect. You see, if it arrives before that, you've got a problem, haven't you? Where are you going to put it? You want two baths in a bathroom? That's tricky. You know, leave it outside? Dangerous, you know. <clears throat> Simple, isn't it? This is a system designed for perfect. They'll never get to perfect. This is the same thinking as Taichiono in the Toyota production system. A system designed for perfect. You'll never get to perfect, but you've got the measures and methods in your hands to drive you towards perfect. The levels of failure demand, of course, fell from more than 50% to negligible amounts. And this is important, you know, because things will always go wrong. Stuff still goes wrong, but nothing goes wrong predictably anymore. And that's how they have achieved delivering a service on the day and the time you want it and halving the costs. And how have you halved the costs? Well, because now 99.9% .9 of the time when you walk in, you fix it. And it's a great lesson to managers in managing value, not cost. When you manage value, you drive costs out of a system. If you manage costs, you drive your costs up. So now they've got a system that's working and it's all manual. So then, third step, pull IT into new design. So they, they called around the local IT suppliers in Portsmouth and they said, well, you come in and have a look at this. And they found this guy and they said, look at this. Look, this is how it all works. And these are our T cards. We want you to automate this so we can see it all just on visual displays, all, all, all electronic. And the guy said, OK, I understand. We can do that. Um, it will take uh, three weeks and it will cost you £2,000. <laughs> and they said to him, if you can do it in two weeks, we'll give you three. And he did. <laughs> <laughs> A normal IT system for handling repairs is north of £150,000. And it does all the wrong stuff. Remember? No, so I suppose this is the bad news for you, isn't it? <laughs> See, but the good news is it works. And of course, those of you who are thinking would realise not only does it work for them, but there's another 700 organisations out there doing the other shit. Customers. <clears throat> uh, I want to sort of back off a little and talk about the problems in industrialising service organisations. I mean, I should say, first of all, that I've never worked in manufacturing. I don't want to work in manufacturing. I've only ever worked in service organisations. Um, and in my lifetime, we've seen service organisations become industrialised. And it's a fundamental mistake. The idea is that we'll get economy from scale. It's a myth. You know, I was with a uh, they talk these days about front offices and back offices, don't they? Do they do that in your country? Okay, and, and, and sharing offices, that'll do it, you know. So, I've, I mean, I was with a, a leader of a council in, in the UK a couple of weeks ago. And I said to him, I bet you built a call centre. Uh, because we had a target in the UK, every local authority had to have a call centre by 2005. I said, I bet you built your call centre in 2005. She said, we did, we did, to comply with the target. And I said, I bet when you opened your call centre, you had more calls coming in than it said in the plan. He said, yeah, how did you know? <laughs> well, I saw it in the 1980s in banks. 
You see, what's going on is the same, in, in, right now in the public sector in the UK, it's the same as what happened in banks in the 1980s. You know, basically banks said, oh look, ACD, or call, about call distributions just come along. This enables us to cut our costs. If you remember, if you manage costs, your costs go up. So what they did is they said, look, we can get rid of these expensive people in our branches that cost us £16,000 a year, that do the telephone work, and we'll move the telephone work to the armpits of Britain, places like Swansea and Scunthorpe, where we can hire people at £8,000 a year and give them the telephone work to do. And so to do this, they, they sent round the men in the white coats with the stopwatches, how many calls, how long they take, that size of the work. You know, got rid of the people, trained the people in Swansea and Scunthorpe, turned the switches, boom, demand went up. It should have been a signal. It's faded demand, it should have been a signal. It's faded demand because, you see, they kind of didn't get the idea that the telephone work was part of a process somewhere. They just set, took the telephone work away. Specialisation is what they think. <laughs> but they didn't see it as a signal. What amused me, and this is going back in the 1980s, the guys running the call centres, they'd actually planned for three... Uh, and the demand went up, so they opened a fourth. And demand went up, they opened a fifth. And by this time, the chief executives already exercised about cost, and the guys running the call centres said, well, boss, it's like the M25. That's the motorway that goes around London. The day it opened, it filled up like a car park. They said, we couldn't have predicted how much our customers love us. They keep bringing us up. <laughs> Bonkers. <laughs> Bonkers. And what, they, you know, what else do we do when, when demand rises? Well, we specialise the work. Oh, that, oh, that's a good idea. Let's specialise the work. We'll have you do loans, we'll have you do mortgages, and that will cut down our training costs. Now, because we specialise the work, another way we can reduce our costs is put on an IVR. Press one for this and two for that. And you know as a customer how well that works, don't you? Because you're, I mean, you're all waiting for the warm body. Uh, or, 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 no, first of all, you're waiting for the explanation that you've got of the problem in your head. Aren't you? And then you don't get that, so you press any bloody thing to get through to the warm body. And then when you get through to the warm body, you explain your problem. They say to you, yes, we understand your problem, but you're in the wrong queue. Stupid you. And so they move you to the back of the right queue, and then when you get through, you explain your problem again. Now, you see, we've just doubled our transaction cost doing that. This isn't an argument against call centres. It's an argument for understanding customer demand. You know, you would be amazed that we don't train people in call centres in why customers call. Typically, in the UK, in financial services, for example, it takes eight weeks to train someone in, in a call centre. Can you imagine that? Eight weeks. You're going to be trained for eight weeks in all of our products, all of our procedures, all of our IT systems. How are you going to feel day one, week nine? You'd be scared to death, wouldn't you? People who take the systems approach study demand. They sort out demand from high frequency to low frequency. This is value demand. This is why we're here. Okay? And we're going to train you. We get you in the training room. We're going to train you in the high frequency predictable demand. Stuff we're going to get a lot of. And in two weeks you're working. Because you get a lot of this. And you're trained to do it. And you're confident. You're also trained to identify the things you're not capable of doing. And when they occur, you pull help. So your rate of learning increases rapidly. And we get rid of all the activity measures because they're of no value whatsoever. You know, in financial services, some companies who love activity measures, they talk about should take times. You ever heard that expression, should take time? And this is like the standard time. I, I, get, I get chief executives that I work with to go around sort of doing thought things to prompt learning. So in the very early stages in this company, I said to him, go around the place and just say to all the managers, we don't want should take times, we need does take times, and then walk away. Because it will just leave a thought that will make their head go zzzz. Because <laughs> if the boss is saying that, I better fucking understand what he's talking about, you know. There's, there's, there's nothing, I've kind of learnt as an interventionist, there's nothing wrong with using coercion as a tactic. Back offices. We think it's a good idea to have back offices. And do you know where the idea of back offices came from? This is Robert Chase in the Harvard Business Review in 1978. 
<coughs> you know, he took the view, as most service organisation managers do, that you know, what we're about in service is sweating the assets, sweating the labour. You know, we worry about how much work is coming in, how many people have I got, and how to get them to do stuff. All that's wrong. So the problem with service, he said, is that um, you know, you're trying to do that, you're trying to sweat the assets, and the bloody customer comes in and interrupts your people. <laughs> so, this is what he says. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to find out what they want in the front office, then decouple the customer from the service and send it electronically off to the back office. Now we can sweat, sweat the bloody assets. And that's what they do. That's what a back office is about. And in the back office, they work on that kind of core paradigm. How much work is there? How many people have I got? How long are they here to do stuff? And everywhere I've seen where we've created back offices, we've seen the same phenomenon that we saw in the front offices, an increase in the volume of activity. It should be a signal, but they don't treat it as a signal. So they specialise the work, they outsource the work, they lean on their people to do things faster, and it, that just creates more work. Wrong. I mean, give you an example. In the financial services sector, I have a client who used to have a front office for all new business and then 144 people in back office positions, some in the UK, some in India. Any demand that came in when they studied it, the managers learned, could be broken into as many as nine separate tasks and sent off to various back office departments. The managers were assuming that <coughs> those nine separate tasks would arrive in the right places the people there would have the right skills, they do them in the standard times and within the service level agreements. And so they had to study for all of these that we do that too. How many go back clean? Can you guess the answer? Zip. Zip. You see, now, if they've studied that, they're going to get interested in a better way, aren't they? But if you walk in and say that's what's happening, they'll get into doing the wrong thing righter. You understand? Let's improve the rules. Wrong. The back office phenomenon has been so bad here in continental Europe that they've now invented the middle office. <laughs> Have you heard of this? When I, I, it tickled me. How absurd. How absurd. Huh. See, all these managers are working on that core paradigm, how much work is coming in, how many people have I got, how long does it to do stuff. It is wrong. Just wrong. I mean, you know, you can't dress it up. Which way do you want wrong? It ignores the nature of demand. That's the first mistake. There's three mistakes here. It ignores the nature of demand. You need to study demand. If your system's full of failure demand, it's under your control, it's destroying your capacity, it's a signal the service design is wrong. It's a big lever for change. You can't get rid of failure demand without redesigning the service. To redesign the service, you've got to study value demand. The nature of the demand from customers, well, how are they, what are they calling in about? Um, because that's how we're going to design the system. We're going to build that expertise into the place where the customer's demand hits. It's really sim as simple as that. The second fundamental error with the core paradigm is holding people accountable for the work they do. You know, you've got to do a call in two and a half minutes, or you've got to do a piece of work according to the standard times. It ignores variation. We've already talked about that. That's why you need does take times, not should take times. If you hold people to account with arbitrary measures, they learn to do anything to meet the arbitrary measures. And that is not the same as serving the customer. It's really as simple as that. Indeed, you need the people who are doing the work, controlling the work, not with measures of their activity, but measures that relate to the purpose of the service from the customer's point of view. And the third fundamental error is if you do anything to stop the system absorbing variety, and the first two things will stop the system absorbing variety, then your costs are going to go up. And this, I suppose, is where we get to lean. Lean. I hate that word. I hate that word. Who invented the word lean? I'm sorry? 
No. Wrong. You couldn't be more wrong. Who invented, let's try again. Who invented the word lean? I'm sorry. Speak up. Wormack and Jones. Congratulations, but no cigar. <laughs> because it was actually John Krafchick who was working with Wormack and Jones. If we want to get picky, I don't know some of you guys like to be picky. <laughs> I suppose in your business you ought to be picky, don't you think? Anyway, but it was Wormack and Jones and the book 1990, The Machine That Changed the World, that publicised the Toyota system as lean. How did Tatiano think about that? Well, of course, he was dead by then. But what did he always say? He said, never give it a name. If you give it a name, the managers are expected to come in a box. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, I mean, I think this is what the Americans are good at, marketing. Most fads come out of America, don't they? <laughs> and, and I think the Americans understand that managers always think change is about training and projects and tools. There's a massive market for tools. So hence, lean. And it took off like wildfire, didn't it? How did Taichiono teach his managers? Did he train them in tools and give them projects to do against known problems? No. No. He stood them in the factory and encouraged them to study the factory to understand what the problems were. You see, it's the same as the housing repairs case. What you learn is the problems you really got are not the problems you think you have when you study Ono's favourite word was understanding. But what do these bloody lean tool heads do when they land in service organisations? One of the first things they do is standardise the work. You see, that appeals to conventional managers, doesn't it? Managers think standardisation, that's going to be a good thing to do. If we standardise, our costs will go down. Wrong! If yours is a service organisation, as every service organisation I've ever worked in is, that has variety and you standardise the work, what do you do to the ability of your system to absorb variety? It goes down. Therefore, what's going to happen to your costs? Up. Brilliant. You see, they've done lean in our tax office. Brilliant. Brilliant. It's going to die because it's CAC. It'll just take a bit of time. There are basically, there are two arguments for economy of scale. The first argument is the less of a common resource argument. You know, so if, for example, we're going to share services or put all work into one place, then we might need fewer managers, uh, fewer IT systems, um, fewer buildings. That's, you know, this is an obvious truth, but it ain't that easy. You know, I heard on the radio last week a guy talking about how the fact, you know, they've shared a service between three organisations and he proudly said, and we've saved a lot of money because we went and built, bought one IT system. And I thought, oh, no, 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 no. This is, like, this is like when your wife goes to the sales and tells you how much she's saved. I go, no, no. Oh, you stupid woman, you haven't saved anything. You spent money. And that's what, that's what these people have done. They have bought an IT system. And they think it saved them buying three. But if you study, you might learn that the way they're using the IT systems is CAC. They don't need them. Do you understand? It ain't just as simple as that. The second argument for economy of scale is the economy through industrialization. And this, this is, this economists have argued this. It goes back to Adam Smith. On the back of a 20 pound note in Britain, there's a picture of Adam Smith. And the amazing productivity you get when you specialise work in the manufacture of pins. Well, do you think that's generalisable? Is that universally true? And then, of course, we have Henry Ford's mass production system where we had specialised work and standardised work. And, of course, Henry Ford brought us the five-day man. You know what the five-day man was? They had such a high turnover of workers because they were all pissed off that if they went away and they didn't come back for five days, we assumed they're never coming back. And, you know, we laugh, but that's what we've done in our service organisations. You know, we outsource this kind of, you know, sweat your assets, sweat your people model to India, call centres. They got an even higher of a turnover of staff in India, despite the fact that we're paying them, you know, king's wages. That's how bad it is. But because 
In manufacturing, we've taken that route. People have taken the idea that we can do this in service. So the second argument for economies of scale is all about economy through design, standardization, specialization, and it's not true. When you standardize and specialize in service design, you stop your system absorbing variety and costs go up. Economy comes from flow, not scale. So how do you design? I mean, the basic archetype for a transactional service organization, you'd pick, pick out from what I've been describing here, because it applies in, in, in the housing repairs case and the other cases I've talked about. I've just talked about transactional systems this morning. By understanding demand, value demand, we know what expertise we need to put right at the front of the flow. That's what we've got to design for. These people with the expertise can absorb that demand, solve the customer's problems. We want to know the does take time. As we improve the system, the does take time falls. We improve further. When they get something they're not trained for, they keep the job, pull help. That's how pull works in service design. We measure how much capability we have to solve problems at the first point in the transaction, confident that the more we do that, the more our costs will go down because cost is in flow. Okay, anything that has to go beyond, like in housing repairs, we measure the true end-to-end -end time, and um, we measure the achievement of purpose from the customer's point of view. We put all of these measures in the hands of the people who do the work, because that brings their ingenuity to work in continually improving the system. And you can't do it without IT. So my message to you today is, if we're going to improve organisations and we're going to use IT as a part of that, which, which we always do, the first step is understand it as a system, get knowledge. The second step is improve it without touching the IT. And the third step is pull IT into that design. You do get less, but you get lots more. Thank you for your attention. Good morning.